Let's try it now. Welcome everyone to the Columbus Bible Church live stream question and answer session. We had a little technical difficulty there and my mic wasn't on. We appreciate you joining with us tonight. We appreciate your patience as we, you know, sort of fumble our way through things as we so often do. Let's uh, go ahead and open in a word of prayer and we'll get started. Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for preserving it for us. We pray, Lord, that we would learn from it and be instructed by it. We pray, Lord, that the saints would search these things out and be fully persuaded in their own minds. We give you all the glory, and it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Our question for tonight is, what is inspiration? What is inspiration? So let's start our analysis of that question by looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So what 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us is that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So as part of the process in which God gave Scripture, it's given by inspiration. But that raises the question, well, what exactly is inspiration? And there's a lot of different theories that people have as to how inspiration operates and what exactly it entails. So let's start in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 2. Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 2. Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 2. Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. And so what God says to Jeremiah is he tells him specifically, the words that I have spoken unto you, take those words and write them in a book. Get with me Jeremiah 36, verse 2. Jeremiah 36 and verse 2. Jeremiah 36, verse 2. Take thee a roll of a book and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee. Look at verse 6, Jeremiah 36 and verse 6. That, therefore go thou and read in the roll which thou hast written from my mouth. Now those three verses we looked at in Jeremiah, what those verses say is that God spoke words. He gave them to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah recorded those words in a book, or in a roll of a book. That is what is frequently called the verbal dictation theory of inspiration. In other words, God dictated the words that he wanted. It would be the same as if perhaps some of you have done this you grab your phone, you hit the button, and you speak rather than type because it's easier to do that. Now, of course, with a phone, it, obviously, it makes all kinds of errors and gets it wrong. But the idea of the verbal dictation theory of inspiration is that what God did is he literally spoke the words. He gave them to the, the recorder of Scripture, and they wrote down those exact words. And you can see in Jeremiah, there are examples of God doing exactly that. But there's more. While there are examples of God verbally dictating the Scriptures, in other words, giving the writers of Scripture specific words that he told them to record, there are other times where God did not give the Scriptures by verbal dictation. So let me give you a for instance, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 
and verse 12. 1 Corinthians 7, 12. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. Now what that verse specifically says is, Paul's not recording there the words of the Lord. He says, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. So those weren't words that were specifically given to Paul. They just weren't. Those were words that he chose. Look at verse 25. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 25. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord. So God didn't give him a commandment. Yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. What Paul's saying in that verse is God didn't give him a specific commandment. What Paul's doing is recording his own, Paul's own judgment. Verse 26, I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. So in verse 25, Paul says that he was going to give his judgment. And in verse 26, he's recording his own supposition. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. Now, maybe you don't, maybe these truths are uncomfortable truths, but the, the verses say what they say. And I'm going to show you why you shouldn't be bothered by this shortly, but it's, it's, it's better to accept truth for what it is, not what you wish it was. Sometimes what happens is people like to ignore verses that are inconvenient or that run contrary to their pet doctrine or what they want to believe. Well, that, that's a fool's errand. Um, the, the verses say what they say. God knows what they say. He wants them there. So it's better to let the Word of God teach you how to think about the issue than to have some invented fanciful theory that's just not so. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 40. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 40. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment. In other words, what Paul had written in the previous verses was his judgment, his thinking. It wasn't, sim- it wasn't something that God specifically gave to him. Get 2 Corinthians 8, verse 10. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 10. And herein I give my advice. For this is expedient for you who have begun before, not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. That verse says that it's Paul's advice. It was his own personal viewpoint. So what, it, what does all of this tell us? Well, there are verses that tell us that God gave the specific words that he wanted recorded. We saw three verses in Jeremiah where he did exactly that, where God spoke unto Jeremiah and told Jeremiah to record the words that he spoke. And there's no question those were the words that God wanted recorded because God spoke those words to him and Jeremiah wrote them down. While God dictated those words in Jeremiah, not every word of Scripture was done that way. And you know that because of the verses we just looked at. Paul said that he didn't have a commandment, but he gave his judgment. He said, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. He said that he supposed, therefore. He said, after my judgment. He said, my advice. So while some of Scripture was given by verbal dictation directly from God the Father, not all of it was. It just wasn't. Inspiration, now now let's be clear about this. Is 1 Corinthians inspired? Well, sure it is. Is 2 Corinthians inspired? Yes, it is. But what that tells us is that inspiration is broader than simply the verbal dictation theory of inspiration. It's not solely verbal dictation. It's not solely God, or it's not God possessing the authors and making them say what he wants. 
It's not that they were put in some trance and they just mindlessly wrote things. You can tell from those verses that Paul was exercising his own mental faculties to write those words. He was making judgments in his mind. Now, does that bother you? Does that trouble you? Does that indicate that the Word of God is flawed or that it contains things that it should not? And my answer to that is no. There's nothing wrong with it. And let me show you why that is. So think about this with me. When we started this study, we were in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 16, and, or 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. So what I'm going to do real quick is we're going to go to our friend Blue Letter Bible, and we're going to look up I-N-S-P-I-R. Why did I do that? Well, because I want to look at every verse that talks about inspiration, but I also want inspire inspired, and so on. So we're going to run that search, and we're going to, then going to study all of the verses that talk about inspiration. Now get ready, this is going to be a long study. Here we go. Blue Letter Bible is calculating the answer, and it's going to tell us all of these verses that have inspiration. Oh, wait, there's only two. Now isn't that interesting? Now inspiration is a Bible doctrine, it's absolutely true, but what's interesting is there are only two verses that talk about it. One is 2 Timothy 3.16 that we already looked at. The other one is Job 32, verse 8. So let's look at Job 32, verse 8. Now this is interesting. When there's a Bible doctrine such as inspiration, and when there's only a small number of verses on that subject, it tells you those verses are deeply important. They're going to tell you how to think about the Bible doctrine. So let's start in Job 32, verse 6. Job 32, verse 6. And Elihu, the son of Barakel the Buzite, answered and said, I am young, and ye are very old. Wherefore I was afraid, and durst not show you mine opinion. I said, Days should speak, and multitude of years should teach wisdom. Verse 8. Notice this carefully. But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. So verse 8 is fascinating. There is a spirit in man. So that, you know, we understand man has a spirit. But notice the second part of the verse. The inspiration of the Almighty, what does it do? It gives them understanding. So here is the definition or the meaning of inspiration in the Scriptures. Inspiration is God giving understanding to a man. When 2 Timothy 3.16 said, For all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, it didn't say that all Scripture is given by dictation from God, but it said that all Scripture is given by inspiration. Well, what's inspiration? Inspiration, according to Job 32, verse 8, is that God gives a man understanding. So what that tells us is this. When God gave the Scriptures, when He gave every Scripture by inspiration, what He did is He didn't dictate every word, although He did dictate some, but what He did in all instances is He gave men, the authors of Scripture, sufficient understanding to write what he wanted them to write. So when Paul mentioned, and let's just, I'll, I'll read to you the, some of the things he said, when he said that he gives, I give my judgment, I suppose therefore, after my judgment, herein I give my advice. In every one of those instances, what God did is he gave Paul sufficient understanding, because that's what inspiration is, God giving a man understanding. God gave Paul sufficient inspiration to know what God wanted him to write. So we can be confident that the scriptures are inspired because what God did is God worked to give the authors of Scripture, the understanding 
that he wanted them to have so that they would record the words that he wanted recorded. Now notice one thing about that. So Job 32 is the first book of Scripture that's written chronologically. I realize the first book in canonical order is Genesis, but Job is written before Genesis. So Job is the first book of the Scriptures in terms of chronological order. And Job 32 verse 6 talks about inspiration occurring even before the book was written, meaning that God was at that point in time giving man understanding as to what he wanted them to know. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. What that verse is saying is man has no ability on his own to know the things of God or to figure out the things of God. Verse 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So how does God reveal truth to us? Well, he reveals them unto us by his Spirit. One of the things you may have observed in life is the world has lots of brilliant people who are very intelligent, very very shrewd, very articulate, but they often have no idea of things that are spiritually true. Well, why is that? The reason why that is, is that you don't understand spiritual truth by what the eye has seen or or by what man's mind has thought. doesn't matter how smart you are, how clever you are, how much you study. You are going to learn spiritual truth because it is revealed by the Spirit of God. Look with me at verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. How do you know the things of God? How do you come to that knowledge or understanding? Well, no man knows it on his own, because what the verse says is the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Well, that explains why much of humanity has no knowledge of the things of God, because if they don't possess the Spirit of God, how would they understand them? They're not going to. It's going to be impossible. They lack the capability to understand spiritual things because they lack the Spirit of God. Verse 12, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So you don't learn spiritual truth by man's wisdom, but you learn it by what the Holy Ghost teacheth, and then notice what it says there, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. In other words, the way that you really come to spiritual knowledge and understanding is you compare spiritual things with spiritual. You compare verse with verse, and the Holy Ghost will teach you things as a result of doing that. That's how you come to understanding. So what what 1 Corinthians 2 is telling us is is that it is God's Spirit that enables man to know the things of God And just as that was true in time past, that is true today. Look with me at 1 Chronicles 28, verse 19. 1 Chronicles 28, verse 19. 1 Chronicles 28 and verse 19. All this 
said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me even all the works of this pattern. The Lord wanted David to build something. Well, how did David know exactly how to build it? Well, what happened is the Lord made him understand in writing by his hand upon me even all the works of this pattern. In other words, God gave David the understanding he wanted him to have. Now that was verse 19. Go up to verse 11 and let's look at the context here. 1 Chronicles 28, verse 11. Then David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch and of the houses thereof and of the treasures thereof and of the upper chambers thereof and of the inner parlors thereof and of the place of the mercy seat. Verse 12, and the pattern of all that he had by the Spirit, of the courts of the house of the Lord, and of all the chambers round about, of the treasuries of the house of God, and of the treasuries of the dedicated things. In other words, what God was doing with, with David is that he was giving a, him a pattern for how the house of the Lord was designed to be constructed. God gave very specific instructions as to how he wanted it done. Well, how did he do that? Well, there was a pattern, and God gave that pattern unto David, according to verse 12, by the Spirit. When you go down to verse 19, it says, The Lord made me understand. Well, isn't that exactly what we read earlier in Job 32, verse 8? When Job 32, verse 8 talked about inspiration, it talked about God giving understanding to a man. Same thing happens in 1 Chronicles 20, 18. God wanted David to have an understanding of the pattern of how the house of the Lord should be built. So what did he do? God revealed that to him by the Spirit. That's how he did it. God uses his Spirit to give understanding to a man. Look with me at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. It's not, it wasn't men's ideas or man's wisdom or man's counsel. Notice what it was. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost moved them to speak gave them understanding of what it was they were supposed to say. Even if it wasn't verbal dictation, God's Spirit gave them enough understanding of what it was they were to say. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. So the prophets prophesied as to grace. Then notice what it says, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So according to that verse, the Spirit of Christ which was in them. So it was, it, it was present with them. And what it did is it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. In other words, it testified to them. It gave them understanding of some things that were going to happen. But notice verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. In other words, they were writing prophecies. So let's think about this just from the standpoint of the chart. 
The prophets in time past, they testified of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, and they were writing about that back here. They were obviously able to write about that because holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. They had understanding of the words that they should record. But notice what verse 10 says. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. So even though the prophets knew the words that they were to record, they did not understand every aspect of what it meant. If they understood every aspect of what it meant, they wouldn't have needed to inquire and search diligently. So what does that tell us? When God inspired the scriptures, what he did is he gave the men who were writing it sufficient understanding to record what God wanted recorded. He gave them enough knowledge so they could record his words. But did they have complete and total comprehension of everything those words meant? Well, they didn't. That's why they had to inquire and search diligently. What that tells us is the authors can understand what it is they are to write without understanding everything that it means. So what this tells us is this. The scriptures are a combination of a couple things. One is the recording of God's words directly spoken to the prophets. There are instances where God did that, such as in Jeremiah. But also, words chosen by men that are nonetheless exactly what God desired because God gave the writers sufficient understanding through inspiration. In other words, sometimes he gave them the exact words, he dictated, he told them, this is what I want you to write. Other times he gave them sufficient understanding so they wrote exactly what he wanted. Now I want to read you a, a quote here that I found in, in a book called Religion and Revelation, A Theology of Revelation in the World's Religions. It's published in 1994. It was written by Keith Ward. And I'm going to just read you this quote. There is a vast literature on scriptural inspiration and revelation. Keith Ward notes in particular five theories of inspiration. One, that God personally authored the scriptures. That's like when he wrote on the stone tablets with his finger. Two, that the human authors were used as instruments by God, hardly being conscious while they wrote. In other words, they're writing, but they're in a trance and they don't even understand what they're writing. Three, that God dictated words into the ears of the writers. Four, that God put thoughts into the minds of the writers, leaving them to choose the exact words. And five, that God illumined the mind of the writers so as to make their thoughts conform to his will. Now, what often happens is in, in theological discussions, people say, well, you have to pick this or you have to pick that, and it has to be one of these five and so on and so forth. What I would tell you is you, you don't need to be constrained by man's philosophy and man's framing of the options. If instead of starting with man's wisdom, you go to the scriptures and you, you approach it from the standpoint of, God, tell me how to think about inspiration. Your word will tell us what we need to know because your word is sufficient. And if you approach it from that standpoint, what happens is you find only two verses. One verse says, all scripture is given by inspiration. So you know that all scripture is given by inspiration. That's pretty clear. But what is inspiration? Well, if you just take the time to run the cross-reference, you find a verse that's, that the inspiration that inspiration gives man understanding. So what God did in authoring the scriptures is he gave men sufficient understanding at different times through different mechanisms, but always they had sufficient understanding to write exactly what he wanted.
And as a result, we can have complete confidence in the scripture. So even when Paul says, herein I give you my advice, or I suppose therefore, uh, where he says he doesn't have a commandment of the Lord and he's instead writing his own judgment, that's all fine. It's, there's no problem with that because God gave Paul the understanding to write what God wanted to write. So now let's consider a question that sometimes follows from that. Is the process of inspiration continuing today? 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, the verb tense there is all Scripture is given. Does that mean that God is continuing to give Scripture today? Well, the answer is, what's the relevant cross-reference? So get Psalm 68, verse 11. Psalm chapter 68, verse 11. Now notice this carefully. The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those that published it. Now there, the scripture is described in the past tense. The Lord gave the word. Our understanding is this. We think what scripture is telling us is that the process of inspiration is complete. The Lord has given the word, and every scripture, every verse of the scriptures was given by inspiration. It's not continuing today. God is not writing new books. The inspiration was complete when the human author wrote the last verse of scripture in the 66 books that we have. Inspiration is not something where God is continuing to write new books or give people understanding as to what it is they are to write. So what does this tell us? What this tells us is that God inspired his word. How did he do it? Well, he did that because he gave the authors of Scripture sufficient understanding to record his word exactly as he wanted it to be recorded. So God wanted it to say, herein I give my advice. God wanted it to say, I suppose therefore my judgment, and so on. So that, can tell, that tells us that we can have confidence in God's Word that He created it, He inspired it exactly as He wanted it to be. What we will do during the next time is we will look at the doctrine of preservation. After God inspired His Word exactly as He wanted it to be, you know what He then did? He preserved it. Because think about this with me. If God inspired the word but didn't preserve it, then you don't have it. And you're here without an authority. And there's no way for you to know what God's will for your life is. But as we'll see next time, God not only inspired his word in time past, he preserved it so that we have it this very day. We'll take that up next time. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father God, Thank you for this time. We thank you that you did inspire the scriptures. We thank you that you gave men sufficient understanding to write your word exactly as you wanted it to be. And we thank you, Lord, that you have preserved it for us so that we can know your will and that we can do the things that you would have us to do. We pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. (music) 